This is a, a T-shirt I got a few years ago about sort of to represent uh, that was represents what uh, sort of the news state of news is today. It's I can't know I don't know if you can see at the back, but uh, it's uh, a mushroom cloud made up of news headlines um, from newspaper clippings, uh, and that's in a way where we are today. So now we're going to start the panel discussion. You can now record. Uh, you can share. Slides back up on the screen, please. And uh, but please refrain from tagging uh, 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 Ms. Aro during the um, during the discussion. Uh, you may refer to her in text, but please don't use her uh, Twitter handle or any tags for her. Uh, now, I'll introduce the rest of our panel, uh, Mr. Stephen Luckert, uh, who is Senior Program Coordinator uh, with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And Mr. Ruslan uh, Denichenko, who is Executive Director of StopFake.org uh, in Kiev. Please welcome them. Um, so we've just had a really uh, interesting introduction in, uh, into what's going on in, uh, in Finland. Uh, and uh, the thing is that the early signs of that experience are things we're starting to see uh, here in North America um, and in other parts of Western Europe as well. Um, this slide that's up here, we're going to have a discussion in a moment. I just wanted to give uh, a bit of a, a grounding to some of the things that are going on. Um, uh, and so this slide right here is from 2013, about far-right extremists, that's Wired Magazine, uh, recruiting on Twitter. Um, this is uh, Motherboard from 2016, uh, talking about white supremacists using Twitter ads. Uh, Facebook, as Jessica mentioned, uh, using uh, or finding propaganda uh, being used by governments. Uh, again, it's from the Atlantic. Uh, same same thing. Facebook finding uh, that uh, there's no contradiction in those reports on intelligence uh, in Facebook being used. Facebook really features prominently, as you've noticed here. Um, Guardian from uh, April, uh, talking about uh, face, uh, Facebook being used to spread propaganda. Uh, there's an Oxford report, uh, Oxford University report in June. Uh, again, white supremacy coming back to this summer and what's been going on in the United States. Uh, just last month in September, uh, a far-right uh, party uh, achieved phenomenal results in the country's election. Uh, and again, they did it using Twitter as a key tool. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think it, it goes on and on and on. Um, this is actually memes being shared uh, in New York Times report from two days ago. Uh, and then Las Vegas uh, with uh, algorithmic um, choices in news presenting uh, false information. So this is the landscape that we're looking at right now. And um, I'm wondering if, uh, Stephen, perhaps you could give a bit of a historical context on, on all these things that we're seeing now and how that relates to things that we've seen before. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I have to preface my remarks by saying I'm not a journalist. I haven't played one on TV. I'm a, I'm a historian by training and, uh, and a curator as well. And so my interest in this comes from the study of propaganda, in particular from Nazi propaganda. And, and I think what we see here today is in many ways reminiscent or parallel to what we've seen in the past. That is, some of the same strategies get employed. The technology is very different. I mean, we've come a long way from the, the 1930s, the 1940s. But even then, if you think about it, the uh, radio was the internet of its time. 
it could crawl, it was, you know, then it was the ether, not the cyberspace. But the idea that, uh, that words and messages and hate could be spread across the globe and could, and could reach into your very homes was something that emerged in the 1930s. Over the course of time, that's changed. Now with social media, we're living in a kind of a different environment. And I think with ISIS, for instance, we saw a kind of a development where individuals could be targeted for propaganda. Not just what we see often in previous propaganda is that particular groups get targeted with special messages. Still goes on today. But with social media, you can tailor your message to that individual. There's so much information out on all of us. We put up, you know, all kinds of pictures of ourselves, all kinds of information that can be used by propagandists to try to reach and tailor their message to us, to play on our emotions. And propaganda generally plays on, on your emotions. And we see this Russian propaganda plays very strongly on emotions, as did Nazi propaganda, as did most propaganda. And, and what we see often today in, in Russian propaganda is that it, it's directed at playing on fears of particular groups, you know, they, whether that's uh, in Germany, whether that's in, in Russia, whether that's in, in various countries. And so we see a lot of the same techniques that were used decades before, but now with new technology and an ability to get those messages out in large and in, in huge quantities and directed at, at uh, individuals. Thanks. Uh, Ruslan, uh, maybe you can give some context. You're here from Kiev, Ukraine, uh, and uh, we were talking earlier today at breakfast about some of the, uh, the rapid changes that you're seeing uh, could you could you share a little bit about that? Yes. Um, of course, thank you so much for your invitation. And uh, uh, I'm from the Stop Fake uh, project, and uh, uh, we are a small team of around 30 people from Ukraine who, uh, for more than three years, now in the business of uh, tackling uh, Russian Kremlin propaganda. And. Um, let me share some of my thoughts and uh, my observation concerning the issue. <clears throat> uh, first of all, we think that uh, Ukraine was probably the first country where uh, Russia tested its, uh, it's not new, of course, uh, yeah, but very powerful uh, weapon, uh, propaganda. Of course, uh, it was propaganda in the Soviet Union, but uh, Russia, I would say, reinvented this powerful tool and we believe that uh, Kremlin managed uh, to organize a, a very bloody conflict in, in our country, in Ukraine. They basically found the, uh, the line of the conflict between uh, Russian-speaking and Ukrainian-speaking population. They fueled this uh, environment with, uh, with fakes, with propaganda. So, uh, a lot of people in Crimea and Donbass start uh, to hate Ukrainian-speaking people, the rest of the country. And uh, so this way, Russia managed with the use of propaganda to organize the bloody conflict, as I said. More than 10,000 people died already in this conflict. So uh, uh, some observation and some lessons. First of all, debunking works. Uh, our uh, project, what we do, we monitor Russian media, mostly media that belong or controlled by uh, Russian government, by Kremlin. And uh, if we see something suspicious that might be not true, we check this information. If, if, we if we found enough evidence to prove that this is not true, we publish a story and we put it on the website. We translate our stories now in 11 languages and we produce uh, two weekly TV shows. Uh, in Russian and in English, and one uh, radio, sh one weekly radio show in in uh, Russian, and uh, a monthly newspaper. So we're trying to reach different audiences with uh, uh, with uh, products of our work, and uh, uh, so debunking works. And in our case, in case of Ukraine, why we think th this way? Because 
we think that we managed to may to uh, Russian propaganda and Russian media look disgusting because they produce so many lies, so many fakes. We have thousands of fakes uh, debunked on our website. So uh, we made them look stupid in the, uh, so basically recent studies show that uh, less than 3% of Ukrainian population trust, fully trust Russian media, Russian television. Now in Ukraine, Russian television, it's just another word for, for lie, for propaganda. And uh, very famous uh, Russian TV anchors like Kiselyov or Solovyov, they are, their names became uh, synonyms of, uh, of liars. Uh, why? Because uh, they produced, uh, you probably heard the story about crucified boy. It's a very famous story. Uh, uh, Russian media reported that uh, a little child was crucified in the city of Slavyansk in front of a crowd of 10,000 people. It never happened. This story was debunked and it was, as I said, was very famous. Another famous story about two slaves. Uh, uh, Russian media reported that uh, you, each Ukrainian army soldier was promised by the government to have two slaves and a plot of land if uh, they returned on bus. So these are like very, very stupid stories, and uh, as I said, we have thousands of uh, such kind of stories. And when we debunk these stories, when we uh, spread this information about things that uh, Kremlin propaganda produces, uh, people start to think, hey, they, they lie. And uh, I think it helped a lot when uh, it was a discussion uh, three years ago, it was a discussion in Ukraine, should we or should we not to, to ban Russian television in Ukraine? And uh, with these thousands of examples, Ukrainian court decided to ban. So uh, a lot of people, even the United States, they, sa they said, oh, this is not democratic, this is another opinion, you are not supposed to do that. But I think it was a very right decision uh, to ban Russian television, and later Russian social networks were banned in Ukraine either. And, uh, Ruslan, if I could ask a question. Yes. You, uh, we were talking earlier, and you mentioned that at the beginning of all of this, uh, people didn't know what to make of it necessarily. Can you talk a bit about that at the beginning, how this, this kind of uh, campaign was regarded and, and um, how it might compare to what we're seeing mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the West now? Uh, yeah, at the beginning, I mean in 2014, it was almost... Uh, every time it was very easy to, de to debunk their, their fakes uh, because uh, uh, they, they were very obvious and sometimes it took uh, several hours to, to make several phone calls and to debunk them. Uh, now, of course, they, they became smarter and more professional uh, and uh, uh, they, they, they mix true facts and manipulations. Uh, they uh, pull the, a lot of disinformation to, from, from their news to talk shows. So uh, when somebody asks, oh, this is, uh, this is fake, but it was not in the news, it was uh, in talk show, it, it was some, somebody's opinion. But still these talk shows, they are going on and on for hours and hours, they discuss the same uh, narratives, they discuss the same uh, things. So people have an impression, the audience uh, uh, have an, an impression that this is true if they discuss this. Uh, so people are brainwashed by basically by watching Russian television. Uh, you, you become to, to, to believe in this because uh, one can hardly believe that uh, the television can manipulate in such a brutal way by, by people. And did people take it seriously at the beginning or how, how, what was the reaction? Of course, because uh, propaganda was not just in news. It was uh, soap operas, talk shows, television, music. It was everywhere. And it was for years. So we just ignored, I mean, Ukrainians, we ignored it. We didn't pay attention to that. And it was a huge mistake, I believe. Because, and now, do not repeat our mistakes. Do not ignore it. Do not think that uh, this is not about the United States. This is not about us. It's about somewhere else. Uh, <laughs> Our experience shows that uh, this powerful weapon can be pointed to any other country very, very quickly. 
and in different ways. It was pointed to Turkey when Russia, uh, uh, when Russian jet was shot down in, uh, in Turkey. And it was like in one second, Turkey became number one enemy for, for Russia, and all Russian media reported that, oh, Erdogan uh, buys oil from terrorists, he, he helps terrorists, he finances uh, ISIS, and so on and so on. And when Putin and uh, Turkish president b became friends again, well, no, this information is not. So he's not a terrorist, I mean, pre president of Turkey. Yeah. Jessica, how does all of this, sort of these, these examples that we've shown over the last few years and, and what Ruslan and, and Stephen have been talking about, how does that resonate with you and what do you see from your perspective as someone who had been targeted? Some of this is for Jessica. So the Stop Fake project, I really recommend it heavily to everyone. Please take a look at it, it's brilliant. And it also inspired me so much when I was uh, doing my work in 2015. And about the Russian TV being, you know, not normal media, yet uh, more like weapon of mass destruction, as one really good journalist and investigator, Peter Pomerantsev, wrote in his book. It, I read super uh, enthusiastically some news in 2015 of Russian soldiers who were being put to warfare in eastern Ukraine. And these soldiers, some of them were really disappointed because they had been watching Russian TV somewhere, you know, in the countryside of Russia and believed all the propaganda coming from there. And they thought that they would go to Ukraine to fight fascist Nazis, because that was the picture painted for the soldiers to justify the warfare in Ukraine and to motivate and to mobilize them to fight. And then this soldier guy told that, yeah, when he went there then, and he was really eager to meet and fight some Nazis, and then he was yet not to find any Nazis there, so he was really disappointed. And this is also one point I would like to make, that all these propaganda and disinformation, fake news operations coming from Russia, originating from there, they are first and foremost um, targeted at Russians themselves. Ask any Russian, you know, look at the uh, research, like proper scientific research that's being done amongst the Russians. For example, one uh, research showed that 80% of Russians believe that the West is doing information warfare against them. And this it's the idea and the world, the parallel universe that they are living in. But now also because Russia has been so successful within their own nation, within uh, Russians living abroad, also that's also one um, important target for them. They also want and will extend these operations to foreign citizens as well. And because disinformation online is super cheap, super easy to produce, compared to actual um, warfare, uh, it will uh, just get worse and worse. And also I would like to say I have been dis um, investigating this topic now more heavily for my book that I'm writing, and I have now tracked back these Russian special and security service fake news campaigns targeted at the West as far away as like the late 1950s, the beginning of 1960s, when then KGB, uh, the state security um, institution, wanted to modernize themselves. So they got a new leader, and their new leader wanted to think that, you know, what would be the best way to destabilize and create chaos in the West because normal full-waged war is not possible. So then he invited all the KGB officers from abroad to Moscow and talked with them and then came the idea of fake news campaigns targeted at the West. Also, um, and this information comes from defectors who defected the KGB. Okay, so yeah, this is the historical point. So this is not a new thing. This is just, you know, this is an old stuff being just brought to us in new channels. Mm -hmm. Stephen, we've been talking a lot uh, about Russia and sort of some of the history, uh, but who else is, is doing this sort of thing? And what are the things that we should be looking out for and some things that we should be concerned about um, as journalists and just as citizens? Well, I think the challenge today is that we have to, uh, I think, educate particularly younger audiences about 
you know, in media literacy. There was a, uh, there was a study that Stanford University did, um, now it's about two years ago, in which they did a, uh, did a study of high school students and university students at American schools. And one of the, their discovery was quite startling, which was that these students were unable, for the most part, to distinguish fake news from accurate information. And so the question is, you know, how do you deal with that? You know, when particularly for younger audiences who receive much of their news information from social media, not from, it, it, there's very much a generation, at least in the United States, uh, a generational factor on those people that, that go to, you know, broadcast news from the, the mainstream media and younger audiences who tend to go to social media sources, whether that's Facebook or whatever, to get their, their news. And so the, I, the challenge, of course, is how do you deal with that, you know, educate people, and the, uh, educate particularly younger audiences to be more critical consumers of, of information. And that's something, for instance, the museum is engaged in doing. We have an initiative around propaganda where we've been working with teachers, working with students around the country, and now we'll be expanding that globally to try to help people, help teachers, and help students to kind of discern, you know, fake information and propaganda from accurate, sort, uh, accurate material. But it's a, it's a major challenge. I mean, you look at, for instance, recently uh, in the United States, there was uh, RT, the Russian, what used to be called Russian, uh, Russia Today, the news, the kind of television and media uh, company that's funded by the Russian government. Uh, recently, Congress has said, okay, that falls under what was uh, the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which in 1938 was created to deal with Nazi propaganda in the United States. So that those organizations, those individuals that are uh, organizations and individuals that are um, uh, promoting, disseminating information from a foreign government have to be identified. And they, it has to be, they have to be registered with the Department of Justice, and that's something that's gone through. Now, the RT has said, this is just a witch hunt. You're suppressing freedom of, of expression. You know, and so they retaliate in kind, you know, saying that this is, you know, they're being unfairly persecuted and that, that those, you know, those liberal idealists who, who talk about freedom of speech, you know, they're suppressing freedom of speech. Are, are they right about that? I mean, it's like, you know, people are, are allowed to say all sorts of crazy things if they like. So I, how, how do you reconcile that? Well, it's a challenge, and I think it's something that we've seen, that we recently we've seen debates in, in Congress about that, you know, applying it to the, the media. Because for a long time, it really wasn't. And now you're having more and more cases of the, uh, the notion that, that media that is acting on behalf of a foreign government should be registered with the Department of Justice. All right, so um, we've been talking about, uh, we're a little pressed for time, so I'm going to skip ahead to the next section uh, um, of this. Uh, and we were talking earlier, Ruslan, about how debunking works. Um, but we also have research that shows that uh, even in the process of debunking something, uh, you can inadvertently reinforce uh, belief in something that's false or incorrect, especially if you're repeating it. So how do you go about debunking something um, without reinforcing belief in the thing you're trying to correct? Uh, uh, I would say that in case of Ukraine, uh, debunking uh, was good, but it was not, it was not enough. As I said, uh, Ukrainian government decided to, to ban Russian television, Russian social networks, and uh, it was, as I said, a, a good and right step uh, in Ukraine. Of course, there, is, there are no, I believe there are no universal uh, responses that will work the same way in Ukraine, in the United States, so in, in, in the European Union. So I believe that each country should find its own way how to respond and how to protect uh, citizens and population from 
uh, foreign influence, of influence of foreign propaganda. Uh, media literacy is good either. We tried it and it, it, it demonstrated good results, but as I said, it was not enough. It's like, uh, in case of Ukraine, it was like when you go to, to the restaurant and they serve bad food, uh, after two or three cases of poisoning people, uh, the regulator will, will close that restaurant, right? In case of uh, media, they, they're poisoning our brains, so let's, let's do something to, to punish them. They are afraid of their visas, American visas, European visas revoked. They are afraid uh, their uh, assets to be frozen in the United States in, in the European Union. So if there are a lot of things that uh, can be done to, in response to, to the efforts to influence uh, f uh, policy in, in the United States, in, in Ukraine, and the European Union. Yes, Igor? Yeah, and I would like to press that journalists are really the key people here in this issue. Like, we are the ones that are under constant manipulation attempts. We are the ones uh, who are being with different kinds of filthy and not so filthy methods, tried to be um, used to repeat these propagandists' lies. And we have seen in different, so many different countries cases in which a proper traditional media that should provide uh, factual information has, for example, presented some fake experts who are then, after investigations, um, ex being exposed as some kind of pro-Kremlin propagandists. And really, this means just more education for us. And we need to also ask for this from our employers, and we need to demand it. And also, for example, in really quick new situations, like uh, 2008 Georgian war, where we already saw the rise of propaganda and disinformation and cyber attacks, and also during uh, Ukrainians' first crisis and then war, there was so much disinformation that it was basically impossible for a normal you know, news uh, reporter to make 100% accurate factual news in the situation of news competition. So. This you need to really demand from your bosses, so more time to make your job uh, more properly. And also what I want to really uh, bring up today is that we have seen um, not so much political uh, Facebook or Twitter paid campaigns in Finland, or at least we don't know about them yet. But we have seen already in the beginning of last year, we saw anonymous troll pro-Kremlin propagandist um, Facebook sites buying visibility from Facebook for postings to which they had first stolen the content from some of the harassment targets social media then invented thoughts and actions to the harassment target and then Facebook helped them to spread this BS to a, an even more wider audience so really think about it Facebook helps and enables this kind of activity. Also, in 2016, I already wrote some recommendations for journalists and governments and uh, legislators, but also to social media giants, that they should stop enabling this immediately. At the moment, there are just like countless troll accounts spreading propaganda and teasing actual people and harassing even children. And at the moment, we're not seeing a proper enough response coming from Facebook or Twitter uh, or, or YouTube as well, which is also used really actively even in agitating people to go fight in eastern Ukraine against the Ukrainian legal government and army. Have, have you heard from Google, Facebook or Twitter on this? Have they responded to you? Um, at least public, no, publicly not, no, and right. I... Well, if there's anyone from Twitter, Facebook, or Google in the room, could you maybe you can have yeah, a chat afterwards. please after comment, we're... please comment, yeah. Um, so, that's the situation today. Uh, we're actually starting to move into another phase uh, where computational uh, algorithms and artificial intelligence um, are being used uh, to, well, not not quite yet create uh, propaganda. It's, right now it's being shown as, as uh, demonstration technology um, with a primary purpose of uh, making entertainment uh, properties uh, uh, more efficient. 
Um, I'm pretty sure that everybody heard about this, uh, this video that was produced uh, of Obama. I'm going to skip over the video um, because uh, uh, we're pressed for time. Uh, so that's in, in labs right now. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Raise your hand if you do. So this is called the Blackbird. It's a, uh, an augmented reality uh, device. And what it does is you can, in real time, let's video play. Yeah. Just to give a clip sense, you can keep the sound down. Um, it's a real time uh, uh, computer simulation. So they're actually driving that computer framework. And in real time, they can change the imagery of what you're seeing. So you could actually have a live feed, a live broadcast of something happening um, in real time. And what you're actually seeing is completely fabricated. Pretty expensive right now, but in a few years, it won't be. Uh, and so this is something that we all need to be aware of, and we actually need to start thinking about the kinds of issues this raises now. Uh, because right now, we're behind uh, when it comes to dealing with the kinds of tools and techniques uh, that are being used to disseminate false information. Um, this is innocuous. This is a uh, car commercial. You know, it could very, very easily be something else. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? <laughs> right, so I mean, right now it's being used for visual effects. Um, before long, it won't be. Uh, one of the areas that I'm really focused on is uh, virtual augmented reality. Um, and that is going to be as transformative as a smartphone within the next few years. Um, the thing about uh, immersive media is that we actually don't have any filters for it. It taps into the function of our brains and, and the neurology of our brains. So when you're immersed in an experience, even though you may be consciously aware that you're not actually present somewhere, um, your brain believes that you are. And whatever you're seeing, uh, you actually have no defenses against it. When you're looking at a video, when you're reading something, you have a critical narrative that's going, and you're able to assess and, uh, and check whatever is, um, is being presented to you. With immersive media, that doesn't exist. Uh, and so that's something else that we need to be aware of. Um, it's, it, it's science, it's technology, it's uh, media, it's uh, creativity. Like we have to essentially bring together all of our faculties and resources in order to uh, uh, address what's about to hit us. And we need to start thinking about that now. Uh, because I, I don't know how, how familiar people are in this room with immersive media, but it's advancing a lot faster than most people think. Uh, and I'm actually surprised by it, even though I've been working in it for years. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? All right, so my project is journalism. Uh, you can go to it um, on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Um, I've just recently started a project looking at working with technologists to try to figure out how to embed trust into immersive experiences. Um, and we're just getting going with that. If you're interested in, in finding out more about that, 
um, please uh, follow uh, and get in touch. Um, we're a little bit over time, but I want to just check if we have, uh, we can take two questions. Um, here and here, go ahead. Here, you have a microphone over, Hi. microphone behind you, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, thank you very much. I, um, uh, I'm from Voice of America. I actually experienced the same, uh, I was a target of trolls and I know how it feels. It's horrible, really, and you d couldn't find any defense and it's, it's really, really difficult. So it would be nice if Twitter would actually act on that and do something about the, about the, the, the trolling. Um, I, question, uh, I would like to... Uh, question. A question, yes, I'm sorry. Um, uh, so I, again, uh, basically, um, I traveled around the Europe. Uh, you can find on TV five, six Russian TV channels, uh, uh, and uh, most of them are propaganda. Here in the United States, uh, Russia today, RT working effectively. They just bought Sputnik Radio. Uh, they are freely, uh, freely op operating in the United States. Uh, what do you think has to be done? You already um, uh, offer some advice, but I would like to uh, hear like one, three points. What has to be done to actually stop or at least prevent some of the propaganda machine that we are experiencing right now? experiencing right now. Thanks. Well, the first thing is to raise awareness. I'm wondering why, when I'm looking at some Netflix really good American documentaries, why is RT used as material of these documentaries as if it was a normal proper, proper media? Why does it work so well? Why did I see so many American uh, officers even sharing RT news about um, Sikh Hillary? during the elections race. Like, why don't people know about it here? Why, really? You need to make people know about it. Yeah, of course it's up to Americans to decide what to do with RT and other uh, propaganda outlets here in the United States, but uh, I have already mentioned some options and uh, I would like to add just probably one. Uh, they hire a lot of young uh, people who just finished uh, school of journalism. I think it, uh, it should be uh, f for, for people uh, who seek job at such kind of outlets, it should be understandable that this is the end of their career in journalism, not the beginning. Yeah, this is a, a major challenge as I, I was bringing up about, you know, Congress trying to deal with, with RT. Uh, I'm, I'm opposed to censorship or, or shutting it down. I, I'm very much a, a free speech advocate, but I think there are ways that you can educate people or I, even um, inform people about what's going on. I think the problem is with the way propaganda operates, particularly Russian propaganda as well as other nations' propaganda. If one uh, avenue is shut down, another one gets created. If you look at how uh, often how some of this Russian propaganda circulates, it doesn't just come from one source. It comes from multiple sources. Like you can go and see the same story from a variety of, of different sources, not all RT. And what that does in some ways is lends that story credibility because it says, okay, well, you know, if all these, all these uh, venues are, are promoting that story, there's gotta be some truth to it. So I think you, you have to kind of expose this, and I think this is what our colleagues here are doing, is to try to bring that out into the open, you know, about how these, how this is, you don't necessarily have to attack each story, but expose the ways in which this manipulation is going on and how it works. Stephen, is this only a foreign threat? No, I, I think that you have a lot of political parties that engage in this as well. Sometimes they're, their propaganda can be amplified by, as, as we've seen, for instance, in the far right in Europe, amplified by Russian propaganda and others. And, and so it gives it, you know, more, it reaches more bigger audiences that way. But we've seen, for instance, in the United States, the far right using Twitter and, and social media have increased their membership, you know, over from 2002 to, 
to, uh, I think, 2016, 600%. You know, that they've taken advantage, they've learned from what ISIS, what other propagandists do, and they imitate that. And it, and it works. You know, so I think the, the, the key thing is, is exposure and, and also creating counter-narratives and also education. All right, we had one other question over here. Yes, you, yeah, please. Uh, hello, my name is Dinara. I'm from one of the former Soviet countries, uh, Kyrgyzstan. I want to ask a question. Uh, looking at the uh, case in the Ukraine, uh, you were fighting with the uh, foreign propaganda, and in, in the same time, does it cause any um, instability in that uh, fragile countries? I mean, while uh, you are fighting with the foreign propaganda, it means that uh, in the country you have the different flow of information towards uh, the people are uh, having. And that's why, uh, does it somehow uh, divide the people among themselves or uh, does it cause any instabilities there? And how do you um, try to uh, av avoid that kind of situations? Who wants to take that one? Um, yeah, this is the kind of the idea of propaganda, how they, uh, how they work. So they're looking for a potential conflict and they fuel it with, uh, with their messages and uh, after that, uh,